This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. I'll try and live up to that wonderful introduction. I feel uh, a little bit overempowered by that. Um, yeah, so I am a microbial ecologist. I actually started out my life as a marine microbial ecologist and um, applying the rules of how bacteria communicate with each other and with their environment, how they sense things, uh, to understanding how they do that in many other ecosystems. What it is a really amazing time to be a microbial ecologist. This is the, one of the few times in history where people have actually taken us really deadly seriously. The first time was probably in the late 19th century when uh, where they found out bacteria could kill you. And now they find out that bacteria can make people healthy. They're really starting to pay attention. And what's great is that the horticultural world is starting to pay attention as well. And the fact that the bacteria that colonize plants and live on the outsides of plants and insides of plants actually may be playing a role in the health of the plant. Now, obviously, this isn't anything new. Um, in fact, if anything, the agricultural world has led the world of science in utilizing and understanding how bacteria play a role in the health of plants. You know, uh, uh, you can't look at nitrogen fixation any other way. But it's been incredibly important for us as researchers to understand how all of the ecological interactions that go on inside the ecosystem, which is a plant, uh, uh, how they play a role in the health and productivity and development of these organisms. So, something to do with plants and microbes. Um, I changed my title. Uh, I, I um, did found the Earth Microbiome Project around five years ago. This was a, an effort to catalog microbial diversity in as many environments as we could find. Um, with my colleagues Rob Knight and uh, Janet Jansen, we, we really uh, tried to push this forward as, a, as a, an opportunity to look into ecosystems and build out a repository to help us understand how many organisms there were, uh, their potential functions, and how they were interacting with the world around them on a global scale. So, you know, uh, as, as famous for Chicago, we had no small plans. This was a very big undertaking. We were very ambitious at the beginning, and then we started to ramp back our ambitions as we found out quite how difficult it was to get people to share their samples and share their data. Um, we initially thought, well, everybody will want to have the microbiome sequence, of course, because the microbiome's awesome. And then we quickly realized that people were not necessarily as excited about sharing all of their carbon data and uh, you know, all the ancillary data that we thought was just ancillary data, which uh, turned out to be people's PhD theses and, uh, and publications. Uh, they weren't quite as willing to share that up front as we thought they would be. And, and so we started to scale back our ambitions. But to date, um, with over the 400 collaborators we have, we've processed around 50,000 samples for um, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, about half of those for, about, uh, for 18S ribosomal sequencing, and then um, a smattering of those for shotgun metagenomics as we slowly burnt through our um, financial supplies and contacts. These represent over 50 large-scale biomes, a biome being like open ocean or um, prairie soil, you know? Um, and there's around 60, 6 billion sequences in this database, um, with a little over 27 million bacterial taxa identified. Um, and the data analysis is occurring in a public forum. All of this data is made publicly available immediately. Um, and we haven't actually published any of the results of this study. Other people have been publishing it for us. Um, and as I was, I was talking to Terry on the way from the airport, I was saying, well, you know, we'd be quite happy if someone wanted to take all this data and actually publish it because it's a pain in the ass to try and analyze it. <laughs> so that would, be, that would be fantastic. There is a, people coming out have been utilizing some of this data to try and understand how many species there might be on Earth and to predict that number of species. And there are exciting studies coming out that are utilizing this data to understand biogeographic patterns, um, the pattern associations with different climactic variables, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've utilized some of these data and other studies in order to try and derive um, some kind of large-scale ecological understanding of the interactions between plants and bacteria and over soil systems. So um, one of the first ones we did as part of the EMP was work with uh, Rebecca McCulley and, um, and uh, Fiera on modeling, utilizing microbial community systems to model how bacterial communities varied across um, a range of prairie conditions in the Midwest. So collecting samples from tall relic, uh, sorry, sorry, relic tall grass prairie sites meant creeping into uh, basically graveyards in the dead of night and taking soil cores and into disused railway lines, anywhere that hadn't really been used um, for agricultural activity since around 1850. Um, so this meant civil war graveyards. 
Um, we, we basically collected samples from those because they were the least contaminated by agricultural activity. Illinois has lost about 98 to 99 percent of its prairie. I mean, you know, that's a remarkable uh, degradation of a natural biological environment and one that, you know, we, we bitterly complain when other countries try and, uh, you know, uh, uh, agriculturalize their land in, you know, in the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. But what we did to one of our primary biological environments nearly comprehensively destroyed it. But we utilize this information to look at the microbial communities um, in different sites around this, um, this, from the extent of this prairie system. And then we interpolated and extrapolated beyond those points to understand how climactic variables that exist now correlate with the position of those microbes um, along with plant variables. And then we hindcast that back to around 1840 to when the prairie was complete. So the, pro the extent of the Midwest um, gra tall grassland prairie system had a distribution that looked something like that. By mapping our um, association between climactic variables and plant distribution patterns, we were able to identify the uh, uh, predicted relative abundances of, of uh, organisms like the Veruca microbia phylum um, across that system and generate some kind of predictive understanding of the distribution of that organism. Now, why is that important? Well, Veruca microbia are hard to culture. Um, the entire phylum has very few cultured representatives in our databases. Um, they flourish where carbon-nitrogen ratios are very high um, because they, they, they don't necessarily do so well when you have a lot of nitrogen. They're good at carbon metabolism and they're good at activating resources which can be used by certain types of plants. And so when soils are turned over to agriculture and you get an increase in nitrogen, you see these things disappearing very quickly. And we're very interested in trying to identify ways to restore these prairie ecosystems. And we, you know, it's all very well to go in and, you know, rip out all of the existing vegetation and just plant a load of new seeds. Um, that, that's proven to be very effective in certain systems. But we're also keen to say, well, how can we create stable ecosystems? How can we rebuild carbon processes and organic matter pools within these systems which support the, uh, the autonomous preservation of that environment? And to do that, we had to understand those bacteria which were significantly related to that and, more importantly, their functional diversity and their capability of supporting carbon and nitrogen turnover in these environments, right? So th this may seem a little bit like, oh, wow, they used time-traveling statistics to predict what things looked like 150 years ago. Whoopee-doo. But if you, yeah, and it does look like that. But... But that's not necessarily the, the be all and end all. What we're really trying to do is capture the system and understand how that system varies, understand what perturbs it, what leads to its stability, so that we can try and recreate it, not just in our computers, but in the field. And so working with um, other researchers around the Midwest and on the East Coast, we're now trying to implement some of the work that we've done here in small plots and actually build out new systems where we, where we have restored prairie sites. Um, we've also been working on this in, uh, in, in a different context, um, but across climactic gradients. So this is work we're doing um, with my colleagues in National Chinese Academy of Sciences, um, trying to understand the differentiation in forest ecosystems um, across a, uh, a climactic gradient along the east coast of China. So um, uh, work uh, in collaboration between our labs, we took samples along this gradient, 110 soil samples from both natural undisturbed forests um, across uh, this, uh, this gradient, um, and then basically uh, analyzed the diversity of archaea, bacteria, and fungi. Um, this paper is uh, in submission. I I'll show you a lot of data today and I, uh, that's uh, not yet been published. So um, you, can, you can feel free to peer review, critique it as much as you want. Uh, but I'm, I've always been very upfront about presenting the data that we, we are already working on. I think it's important to get feedback from the community. And also, if you can analyze it faster than we can, then go for it. That'd be cool. Um, but um, so, you know, we see a lot of Crenocleota. We see a lot of Aphrodibacteria, no big deal. We see a lot of Ascomycota. Uh, but we do see amazing biogeographic variants. And we can map and model that variance to large-scale network patterns to identify strong correlative interaction space between different kingdoms of organisms. So every dot here is a bacterial OTU, every green dot is a, a eukaryotic OTU, blue is archaea, uh, red, uh, bl black lines sorry, are positive, and the red interactions, you can't see many of those. In fact, I can't even see them, and I'm looking at close, there's some there, 
our, um, our negative co-associations. And this, again, just looks like a morass of, of network information. But by teasing apart the topology of these networks, we can actually start to understand how some climactic variables can lead to differentiation in co-association patterns. So all these connections are strong and significant. Only those with the Spearmans of greater than 0.7 are actually identified in this network structure. Each size of each node is proportional to the relative months of the organism. And there are 66,000 associations among 3,000 microbial OTUs, OK? Um, oh, sorry, nearly 4,000. 90% of these interactions are global, and only 10 are region-specific. So there are inherent structures within forest ecosystems across the eastern seaboard of China, which are globally distributed no matter what we see in the system, suggesting that there's niche specificity within a forest ecosystem, irrespective of the climactic region. But the inherent variance in the system, this 10% of these interactions which are region-specific, that's what yields climatic range specificity. And that climatic range specificity is what's interesting to us. Because by understanding the variance between regions, we can start to understand what makes an ecosystem important in that environment. Because those organisms may be important to the system ecology. Um, so looking at this, if we look at um, how we interpret that network topology, the connectivity of the network is greater. We get more connections, more significant interactions between bacteria, archaea, and, and eukaryotes up in the, um, in the northern region compared to the southern region. We get greater precipitation in the south. It's a, a semi-tropical environment. Um, and we believe that this greater precipitation leads to decreased niche differentiation. Essentially, you're getting more moisture connectivity in the environment. Moisture connectivity allows microbes to uh, move out of their individual pockets and interact more on a global scale, indirectly through um, metabolite transfer and directly through movement. Um, and so you get an a decrease in the, in the um, specific niche connectivity between organisms and an increase in a broad scale characterization of network space. So lower precipitation in the north induces a strong niche differentiation. Basically, organisms clustering down in their little niches, um, dif disassociated from other organisms which may be a millimeter away on another organic mass matter particle. And that, that niche differentiation is a globally attributable trait. Um, in a study I'm not going to talk about in detail, and I, actually I'm not going to mention, apart from right now when I am going to mention it, um, but the hospital microbiome project, we, in this study we, we followed a hospital environment, um, uh, 10 patient rooms, two nursing stations, for 365 consecutive days, cataloging all of the patients on three body surfaces and all of the staff and all of the environments within the hospital, um, some 50 different surfaces, including air and water. And we looked at the bacterial community structure across all of these environments, and we see that people share more bacteria between each other um, including patients to staff and staff to patients and staff to staff when the environment has more humidity. Basically, when bacteria have the capability of surviving outside the body, we see a de definitive increase in sharing. What's interesting, and I, again, I'm telling you unpublished data, which is currently in review, but um, just don't tell anyone. Um, we don't see an increase in disease burden in that population. So this increase in microbial sharing isn't leading to an increase in horizontal, sorry, so hospital-acquired infections. It's just distributing microbes on a bigger scale. In fact, if anything, we see a small depression. And we can talk about what that means until the cows come home. But moisture is very important. It allows for connectivity. It allows for increased activity and movement of organisms between sites. I, I am very tangential as well. If I go off on a too weird a track, does someone throw something at me and I'll, I'll try to get back onto what I was talking about before. Anyway, so utilizing this information, we can start to build out um, uh, intercontinental and transcontinental understanding of, of microbial community structure and what it means in a system. So this is the Tibetan Plateau in North America, collecting samples in transects um, um, and uh, dotted samples around areas and transects around the Tibetan Plateau across climactic regions, we can start to interpolate and build maps of microbial community structure across these systems and link them into climactic variables in an attempt to try and predict how these systems respond to climate changing environmental systems. So, um, I don't know if this will work, but yeah, here we are. So this is the Tibetan Plateau starting in 1900, we're now in 1925, 1930 with annual averages and the shift in microbial community structure 
uh, or beta diversity across the whole system as we move across um, uh, a, a, dec uh, sorry, a century of climactic variants. Um, what we see in this pretty picture is a, is a significant change in the, let me just play it again so you can see it while I'm talking about it. Is a significant change in the community uh, fluctuation, in the, in the differentiation of microbial community structure as parts of the system become uh, destabilized due to increasing temperatures, as parts of the system become highly productive due to increasing carbon dioxide, and as agricultural activity takes over in the, uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, yes? How do you know what it was in 1910? Because I went back there. I'm, I'm English. I'm a time traveler. Um, <laughs> have you not watched Doctor Who? Uh, so it's, 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 it's hindcasting. We actually have pretty good climatic records back to 1910. Prior to 1910, they don't exist. There were weather stations uh, present in parts of Tibet back then. Um, and they were you know, first part by the British and then, and then later by um, some of the French and then the Chinese. But the, the system's been reasonably well monitored. And we have good records for global climate variables at degrees of uh, resolution for pretty much the whole globe back to a certain level, mostly interpolated from existing data. So, I mean, it's a model, so. Oh, yeah, everything's a model. So it agrees with your model. Right? Yeah, 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 damn right. <laughs> can, you, can you prove me wrong? No, but I'm not trying to predict what happened beforehand. I'm trying to understand, if anything, what the relationship is between uh, microbial communities' destability or stability between years and climactic variables. And because I can, even within a five-year grant, I can only get five years of that data, I have to try and predict outside the bounds. Um, but you can use this to make predictions about what's happening now with, you know, uh, at a fine scale uh, if you understand what the long-term trends might be. So again, this is just a pretty picture, but underlying it is sort of fundamental m m uh, statistical model which can help us to extrapolate and predict beyond our measures. So in here, what's interesting is the microbial community structure of present-day Tibet is best predicted. No, I'm talking to you alone. I'm going to stand here. Um, <laughs> best predicted by the the climactic variables in between 1968 and 1972. So if we look at the, which again is a bit weird, right? But if we look at the climate in 1968, 1972, that is the climate which best correlates with what we observe in current day Tibet. And the same is actually equally true for, um, for uh, North America. And if we take that as a, a variable um, predictive algorithm, it means that we can predict if nothing changed on Earth uh, for the next 30 years, taking today's climate, we can predict what we should see the system stabilized to in about 30 years' time. So on that basis, um, this is obviously Tibet and North America. This is the current richness. And um, in, over the next 30 years, if we believe that climate has this relationship between uh, time and microbial community structure, we'll see a significant shift in richness. Basically, the systems will become in increase in richness due to destabilization of community structure and reduction in abundance of certain key organisms. But Whereas um, most of Tibet will show a regionally hom homogeneous predictive capability, the, um, the, uh, uh, the North American coast will show a highly heterogeneous response variable. But still, majority will increase in, in richness. And um, if you see the similarity between what happens in northern Canada and what happens in this other, basically, uh, semi-Arctic zone, uh, they call Nepal the third pole on Earth, we see a, a, a similar increase in richness due to a destabilization of, of, the, um, of the adaphic variables in the soil system. Obviously, this is highly linked to plants. But what we haven't done at all is use plants in any of these calculations. We would love to, but we don't have a lot of the data. What we do see is um, uh, variance in the types of bacteria that we find um, across these different systems. And we can correlate that to plant inputs. So in Tibet, we'll see an increase in alpha proteobacteria. Let me qualify that statement. We predict if everything stays normal and there's no inputs at all that we'll see an increase in alpha proteobacteria and a decrease in North America, okay? Alpha proteobacteria in both of these systems, in these soil systems, show a significant correlation to carbon nitrogen uh, ratio and therefore we believe that this could be linked into um, um, and soil moisture and could be linked into a uh, distribution in the change in below carbon inputs into the system, right? So by changing below carbon inputs based on changing um, um, uh, uh, plant uh, biodiversity and plant structure, we'll see a shift in the microbial community structure. Again, whoopie-doo, but at least we've got some kind of understanding of the potential implications. 
And we're now trying to use this to predict occurrences each year in, in these systems. But it's very broad scale. We're hoping to get much finer resolution as we move forward with our ability to classify the system. OK. Um, to something totally different, Merlot. Um, uh, I know, I, know uh, I, was talking, I was talking with the guys working on uh, Riesling earlier. Um, but you know, we, we started out in Merlot. I, I, I also love wine. I um, think it's awesome. Um, and we were very interested in the connectivity between above ground tissues in, in plants and what was happening in the soil and trying to understand the potential implications for um, strain type variants and uh, microbial community structure and adaptive variables in soil systems. So um, number one, this is just a, uh, a map. Uh, if the dots are closer together, more similar. The black dots represent OTUs. Ha. Huh. Oh, yeah, sorry. The black dots represent bacterial taxa. Um, and the, the colored big dots represent a sample. And so what you've done is basically taken all of the dots, the, all the OTUs, and the similarity and the abundances of those OTUs starts to drag together or pull apart um, individual sample types. So bulk zo soil and root zone, I call it a root zone. It wasn't rhizosphere. It was just the soil around the roots. Um, uh, all cluster very closely together because they're very similar in environments. And then your root system, so the rise of plane, starts to differentiate significantly from that. And as you move up into grapes and leaves and, and yellow flowers, we see a significant differentiation. But you notice that uh, the OTUs that are shared in the soil are also shared down here. There are lots and lots of these lines connecting these green and yellow plots down to the, the yellow and, uh, sorry, the uh, blue and red plots over here. And so that, that immediately told us that, that the vast majority of OTUs, the bacterial tax that we found up in the above ground tissues, came from down here, or were also found down here. Uh, if they didn't come down there, they came from there by some other route. Um, a below ground, you know, you see um, a significant differentiation in the high level functional stru community structure of these communities. Um, the uh, proteobacteria dominating those above ground systems and mostly organisms which are good at dealing with stressful environments. Um, if, we, if we look at the types of um, uh, adaptive variables which drive differentiation in these systems, we see um, that the adaptics are very important, particularly carbon nitrogen ratio um, and pH. pH was a very interesting one for us. We saw we looked at different uh, vineyards throughout a vineyard, vineyard region. What's a vineyard region called? Like a winery region, whatever. I don't know what to call it. But a place where there are lots of vineyards. And we looked at the same strain of Merlot, the same ecotype of Merlot across these different vineyards, and then cataloged how the uh, community structure changed across those vineyards. And we see pH is a big variable that drives that. Because different vineyards use different types of organic fertilizer and inorganic fertilizer to fertilize the soil. And while we saw impacts of carbon and, um, and, and carbon nitrogen ratios as drivers, the pH induced in the different soils was still a key driver, which is known. Um, and interestingly, there was a significant um, effect due to air temperatures, indicating a driver for the microbial terroir, especially on the above ground surfaces. Between 2011 and 2012, we saw a significant differentiation in the flowers um, and in the, um, in the leaves between the two um, annual time points suggesting that a change in temperature could have an impact upon what's happening to the microbial population, um, including in the soil. So these, 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 the system variance was being driven by uh, soil adaphics and also climactic variables. Um, ch changing tack again. I'm, I'm switching around because I've, I have lots of stories to tell. Um, we, this is all very well and good, understanding how community structure differentiates across these natural gradients. But what I'm most interested in is why why certain bacterial organisms are finding themselves co-associated with this environment and becoming abundant versus this environment. What is the selective pressure driving those organisms to, uh, to develop in that space? How do they evolve to adapt to that environment? And the only way to do that is to start to rebuild the genomes of those organisms, uh, from my perspective, and look at the evolutionary drivers and the trait selection within those populations. Um, so. Um, we reconstruct genomes on a large scale from a typical metagenome. We can grab lots of different bacterial isolates from different genera in that system. We can grab viral genomes. We can even grab some archaeal genomes. And we can utilize that information to build out metabolic models which describe how those organisms interact with each other and with their environment. Um, so this is a great example. Working in a soil system um, with hydrochlorohexane uh, pollution, 
So this is a, um, when you create lindane, um, you, uh, you have a pollutant which you throw back into the soil, and there's these huge HCH dumps in certain countries around the world. Uh, they're illegal in a lot of countries, but they create a very uh, toxic environment. Um, and so by looking at HCH degradation in the microbial community, we can um, uh, we look at organisms, we can culture up and genome sequence, and we can map those to metagenomes we collect from these environments. And utilizing that information, we can predict what the last common ancestor of the extant population in the system would have been. And utilizing this information, it suggests that um, uh, the ancestor genotype well, uh, lacks um, uh, it suggests that 20% of the genes in each subspecies were absent in the ancestor. So these, these subspecies we see present in the system have gained genetic material due to a selective pressure driver from, from the pollution event. Um, the ancestor, we, we predict, is unable to grade HCH, and it acquires the Lin genes to allow it to um, uh, degrade HCH from uh, this transposon-mediated lateral gene transfer. And we can actually even isolate a lot of the transposons and transposon elements in the, in the genes, in the genomes of these organisms, and co-associate them and their um, non-synonymous synonymous ratio with uh, the lindane, re lindane degrading regions. Um, and this helps us to um, uh, predict the functional capability of that organism and how it evolved that capability. So, you know, I know, I, I understand what you're thinking. I've gone from the entire planet and I've now zoomed down into one genome. But looking across those scales is really important. And we can also go even further when we dig down into the metabolic capability of an organism. So this is working work we did in peat moss um, and looking at thalmycosis and thermoplasma. Um, Thalmycosis oxidizes these long chain fatty acids via syntrophic interaction with methanogens. Um, and what we've been able to do by taking the genomes of these organisms and looking at them across redox gradients in the system we can identify the, the, the drivers which allow these organisms to respire. So the, uh, we've got anaerobic respiration with fumarate as a terminal electron, et cetera. When we, when we look at thermoplasmata, um, uh, another organism for which we had no uh, genome relatives in the system before, we see sulfite and organosulfonate uh, reduction as the driver for its capability to respire. So turbid electron acceptors are depleted to very low levels in some of these systems, and yet anaerobic respiration is really dominant still um, uh, you know, as, as a key component. And so why are these, uh, these RK are particularly abundant? So looking, you know, we now fumarate and organosulfonate uh, are important for respiration of the carbon mineralized in these peatlands, which gives us an ability at the molecular level to start to understand the potential implications of changes in this environment upon carbon mineralization, right? And the remineralization of components into the biosphere and driving potential changes in, um, in climate systems. So taking, you know, I've gone from making spurious comments about what happened in the 1840s to driving all the way down into the potential metabolic interactions of an organism with its environment. And linking those substrates between the two is going to become increasingly important in our ability to derive um, uh, appropriate, accurate, predictive uh, climate models from what we can understand of um, as a system driver in, in the soil environment. Um, I'm just going to go to a new study, sorry. I really like this one. This is a brand new one. Um, I, I have no attention span. You can understand that from this. Um, so we really interested in invading plants, mostly because when we were working in long tall grass prairies, we see this beautiful relationship between a stable ecosystem and it's it's very stable but highly um, sorry sorry very uh, permanent but highly unstable community structure. When we perturb that long grass prairie, even an iota the system starts to disassemble, okay? Um, increase the nitrogen by a small margin, the system disassembles. So we wanted to understand, well, how do, when a plant starts to invade the system, how does it influence that below ground microbial community? And what are the significant drivers? And um, what can we say about the, uh, the, uh, the legacy of an invasion um, in, in terms of perturbing our ability to restore that environment back to what it was before? So working, we got this, multi-billionaire in, in Chicago who bought up a load of land in Montana um, because um, he wanted to be a biologist when he was a kid, but his daddy said no, and he went into the city and he made a lot of money, and now he gets to play in his sandbox. Don't you love those people? Only in America can I find that kind of human. I love it. So we get to play, 
in his sandbox. And so he's, he's basically trying to, his gambit is restore the ecosystem back to the original tall grass prairie. So he bought up 10,000 acres of ranch and set us with this task. So the initial task is to try and understand why that system needs to be restored. So here we have three gradients of uh, cheatgrass, knapweed, and leafy spurge, um, an invasion gradient from high abundance of the invader to uh, absence. And so all intents and purposes, this is native prairie um, going up to um, a, an invaded plot. Obviously, um, for, for the plants, you do see a very strong gradient between the plant biodiversity and, and, the, um, and the invasion plot. When, when you get a highly invaded plot, um, you have, oh, sorry, highly invaded plot, you have a highely differentiated plant biodiversity, uh, a beta diversity pattern. Uh, bacteria show a similar but not quite as robust trend. Apart from, apart from in the, um, the leafy spurge, uh, oh, escular, I can't remember. That might be leafy spurge or cheatgrass, but either way, it shows a very strong gradient. The fungi show a much stronger gradient in response, uh, their beta diversity pattern shows a much stronger gradient in response to the invasion pattern. And so we can start to say that yes, invasion does have a, an impact upon the microbial community structure in that system. Um, we can differentiate that from, well, maybe this invasion area was pre-supposed to be good for those plants because of these microbial community structures or, or some kind of edaphic variable by looking at this over time. So we, uh, in common garden experiments, we planted up these systems with invasives. One year after planting, um, there's no real significant difference between the microbial community structure in either um, uh, the native environment in green, cheatgrass in red, knapweed in blue, or spurge in yellow. So one year was not enough um, in these systems to derive any kind of uh, spatial differentiation pattern. But after three years, the system starts to arrange. And we're now pushing this on, but we've only just got three years, uh, about um, eight weeks ago. So um, what we're starting to see now is, at least, at least for knapweed and for spurge, we're starting to see significant clustering of those populations, uh, the microbial communities in the below ground systems around that invasion system. So the system starts to show consistent shifts in chemistry and microbial community structure. I'm not showing the chemistry here. Um, and we believe that these uh, modifications to the soil properties, probably driven by increases in carbon inputs into the soil due to predatory release of the, of the invader in its, because it's not, not in its native habitat anymore, reinforce the dominance of the invader, um, making sure that those invasions are difficult to remove. We think, unfortunately for our billionaire playboy, that it's very, very hard to remove some of these invaders, nigh impossible, um, once they get to a certain level, i.e. their legacy on that soil system might be, um, might be unattainable unless you go through a, an incredibly dramatic ecosystem structural difference. So anyway, uh, finally, um, Fertilization reduces bacterial so I just wanted to point this out. Uh, we, we do a lot of work uh, with groups um, in Africa trying to understand. I've never been to Africa to myself. I was saying this to, uh, to uh, Rebecca earlier, but I'd love to go. Um, but we, we are trying to take some of this data and put it into a more translational framework so that people, growers especially, can start to utilize it. And so trying to understand how uh, differential land use strategies such as rotations and fertilizer combinations can be used to increase functional capacity. So utilizing um, uh, numerical models and statistical models, we can start to understand the potential implications of differential um, uh, land management strategies for improving productivity for some of the 900 million poor people who are using um, agriculture as their subsistence mechanism. Anyway, on a completely different note, how much longer have I got? I know I've got to be strict. Got about seven more minutes. Seven more minutes? OK. Um, you are currently sitting in a built ecosystem, right? Every single one of you is emitting 38 million bacterial cells into your environment every hour. You're all becoming more microbiologically similar. The people who are sitting closer to each other are becoming more microbiologically similar than the people sitting further away. If you are physically interacting, you'd be increasing that degree of similarity. And this environment is the environment where we're all growing up, okay? Where we as a species, unless you grew up on a farm or you grew up in the Amazon rainforest, I don't know, there might be some people in the room that fit that description. The vast majority of us grew up in a 20th century home, or some of you 21st century home, and that has significantly altered your microbial interaction compared to what your ancestors experienced. Um, your ancestors probably experienced a more agrarian lifestyle, 
interacting with the cows and the pigs, not playing on their iPads, but actually living outside and working outside even as young children. And that increased the microbial biodiversity of their bodies. When, uh, my, when your child is brought back from the, from the hospital and lives in this environment where it's consistently cleaned and made quite sterile, this architecturally artificial system is altering their microbial profile. But enough about health. Um, we started off this whole gambit on health, but I wanted to talk a little bit about microbial forensics. It's a new track of mine, something I'm very interested in. Um, we started out by doing a study for the Sloan Foundation on the home microbiome. We found, um, among other things, that families, um, we could look at the bacterial community on, say, the floors and the doorknobs, etc., and we could, with a high degree of accuracy, predict which family belonged to which home based on the bacteria they left behind in their home. Because of those 38 million microbial cells you're shedding, your microbial cloud these are microbial fingerprint in your home, right? Nice. This is, um, this is uh, each one of these shows a, a particular surface, focus on the kitchen counter. These are three people, uh, a grown up child living with their, his parents um, and the three dogs. Um, if we look at the kitchen counter, person three, their microbiome is the predominant influencer of that environment, the predominant source for bacteria found in that environment. Um, she's the mother of the family, there's no gender bias here. But you can see that um, she actually went away for a little while. Person one goes away here, and his microbiome disappears. Uh, that's the red one. But person, uh, person two, who is the father of the home, his microbiome suddenly became dominant in the kitchen when his wife went away for a couple of days. <laughs> so it's a lot, isn't it? Um, the kitchen floor was dominated by dog bacteria. And we think this is obviously important because dogs are significantly contributing, as well as the mother's bacteria having a different role because her cloud is depositing bacteria there. Um, we can also tell when people are physically interacting. It's a young couple living with a lodger focused on this uh, PCOA diagram over here. Um, we can tell that the red and blue um, samples are closer together. That's a couple who are not genetically related, but who are living together and sharing more microbes because of their physical interaction, hopefully not with the lodger. The lodger does indeed show a significantly differentiated microbiome compared to the young couple. More similar to the young couple than he is to anyone else in our study because he's living in the same space and sharing the microbial cloud. Their noses are not microbiologically uh, similar because people don't interact with their noses. Um, so working uh, with Time magazine, we applied this technique with the Departments of Justice to set up some crime scene investigations. That was the unfortunate cover of our, uh, <laughs> our issue of Time. But Jared Hampton Marcel, who's my, my awesome lab manager and, and all-round uh, guru, he, um, if you ever want to know anything about DNA extraction, he's your man. But um, he went down to uh, Florida because it's warm in the winter and worked with the Florida PD on, uh, and the, their forensic team on setting up a crime scene. Crime scene, uh, we had a professor's house from a local university, uh, his wife and their cat living in a house. They went away for like 10 minutes and two of the students, well, like an hour and a half, sorry, two of the students broke into the house and, um, and ransacked their fridge, uh, stole their TV. Um, and they were in there for like 35 minutes and then they left, okay? Uh, we went in with the PD because this burglary had happened um, and um, we uh, swabbed all the surfaces of the floor, sequenced the microbiome on the floor and on the surfaces. We went, then brought the uh, husband and wife and the cat back in and sequenced their microbiome from their skin surfaces, subtracted the resident's microbiome from what we found on the floors and the surfaces. So we had a residual microbial fingerprint. And then we ran that microbial fingerprint analysis against 8,000 people in our database of skin microflora um, with also with, um, uh, with uh, the two students who had burgled the house, because we knew who they were, right? We sent them in. And we could identify the students with 99.6% accuracy based on our 8,000 people. The microbial fingerprint left over is actually slightly better than using their genotype. Um, if you just use um, you know, uh, standard genotype fingerprinting and not whole genome sequencing. So we are very excited by that. The Department of Justice is very excited about that. And they've funded us and JCPI and a few other people to expand this into a large study to determine the potential of utilizing this kind of uh, microbial forensics in order to detect crimes in, in the coming century. And if you think about the number of people that are put in prison on the basis of bite marks or uh, hair fibers or clothing fibers, which are bullshit for detecting anything accurately, um, this might be a valuable addition to a forensic team's catalog of tools in order to get the right, the wrong people in jail. You know what I mean? But the, you know, get the baddies in jail and get the, keep the um, goodies out of jail. Um, um, I just want to point this out finally because I've got like two minutes, right? Maybe a minute. Um, I mapped my microbial dynamics in our house. This is my family. I don't give a shit about IRB. I suck it. Um, 
talking to Ruth. <laughs> uh, and uh, you, I'm even going to go worse. This is my youngest son. Uh, let them fire me. This is my youngest son. He's microbially interacting with the bedroom floor. He was the only one that really had a hand interaction with the bedroom floor. Why? Because he's crawling around on the floor, right? When he was two years old, we did the study. And so you can see these weird little interactions and map them. When we add dogs into that mix, dogs significantly increase the microbial distribution patterns of the, of the home. They, they increase the amount of sharing between people. Uh, my colleague Rob Knight showed that if you have dogs in a home, you're more likely to share more bacteria than if you don't have dogs. And we mapped out that interaction over six weeks of daily analysis. And you can see that the dogs do indeed significantly increase the diversity and diversity of interactions. What's it? My wife made me use this to rescue a dog from Kentucky. His name's Captain Bo Diggley. He's a proper southern captain, apparently. Um, and he has actually increased the microbial diversity of our house, only by a small margin. And our house is an N of one, but it was significant compared to the time periods before. Um, and so we think this is important because if you introduce dogs into a family's home when the child is under the age of one, they have a 13% reduction in the likelihood of developing asthma. And work from uh, University of California, San Francisco has demonstrated that dog bacteria such as lactobacillus when gavaged into a mouse's intestine can significantly reduce the likelihood of that mouse having an asthmatic attack. Okay, so these interactions all suggest that every single one of you should go out and rescue, I repeat, rescue, not buy, a dog as soon as you possibly can. Um, and I'm going to end there because I talk about toilets and stuff and I got a bit carried away. But... <laughs> Um, but I would just like to point out, um, uh, we have a new journal, M Systems. I mentioned it. Anyone that's interested in microbial systems biology and um, you, you want to publish in an awesome journal where you get rapid decisions, blah, 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 um, then you can publish in our journal. We have a great line of senior editors um, uh, from across the board of kind of the research areas. And we have over 110 editors. And those 110 editors are the ones that will handle and make decisions for every manuscript, so you'll get fast, rapid decisions. And I am on every single one of those 110 editors to make sure that the reviewers uh, give out reviews in the time frame which they have agreed upon. So no more waiting around. And I've, I've been a senior editor at ISME Journal and Environmental Microbiology, and I understand pain. Mm -hmm. So this is my way of getting out of pain. All right, that's it. Thank you. Century. So yes. When I change my microbiome when I go to my house, just like shut or, or change it afterwards? It's not based on the structure, it's based on the composition. Right. So, no, not easily. I mean, you could take a fecal microbiome transplant, and if you waited long enough, you'd replace your micro intestinal microbiome with somebody else's. So I couldn't, like, swab myself with some bacteria. It's possible you could do it for a short period of time, but remember, your skin is not just the surface, it's a deep contextual environment. And um, if I sterilize your hand right now with an alcohol wipe, in three minutes afterwards, I'll be able to detect your unique microbiome because it bubbles up back from the surface, right? So we've done that study on a number of occasions. Um, they're very, we're very keen to know that because, you know, I, the, the best thing about it is, yeah, you might be able to perturb it, but you're not, not, I'm very unlikely to be able to change your strain level differentiation. And unless you're wearing a hazmat suit, you're never going to be able to stop it from shedding, even if you wear gloves. It's constantly leaving your body. Yeah. Okay, but to well, you're on CD, you're constantly spraying surfaces with antibiotics. Yeah, yeah. What does that Well, okay, so um, uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I'm, I'm split between this. I don't think it should be done in, 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 in small children's environments. Could you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. The, the question is spraying antibiotic cleaning products onto surfaces, what impact could that be having on people's health? Man, it's got all that moody. <laughs> and, uh, Terry, Terry, uh, Terry, over here on the wall. But it doesn't matter. So, um, oh, so just pretend, pretend the lights are on. If you, oh, there you go. Um, um, so, what we're most interested in is trying to see if it affects health. Okay, and we see no real implications between health because, as I said, it's, if you use these things and then you and then you interact with something, you're picking up a microbiome. Your microbiome resurfaces pretty fast. We do know that certain cleaning products, things with triclosan, can have a potential impact, and they might have some hormonal impact, although that's still tenuous. I don't have any conflict of interest with any of the companies who manufacture these things. But I would say that in infants who are developing, I think it's dangerous to sterilize the environment as much as we do. I think we should actually be increasing their interactions. And we work with Amish and Hutterite families, 
who, you know, the Amish live on personal fam, family farms, the kids always interact with the animals, the Hutterites don't, only boys over the age of 14 are allowed on the farm, they're both from the same ancestral population, they both live a very similar lifestyle, apart from that one removal of a microbial source in the Hutterites. The Amish have virtually no asthma in the population of 35,000 people we look at, the Hutterites have 30% asthma in their, in their population. Could we do something else? That's a remarkable coincidence. So I would say increasing the biological diversity in a world where we can control pathogens through uh, vaccines and, and controlled um, measures with our community and our environment, we should actually be increasing our microbial diversity through interaction with the natural world rather than decreasing it. Off my soapbox. <laughs> um, there's about yes. um, can you like extend that concept of increasing diversity? You can. I, I, have, I have an autistic son, so I'm slightly biased in this respect. Um, my, uh, I honestly believe that um, that there is a significant link between microbial dysbiosis in the child's gut, especially early in life, and development of the brain. And we we have some evidence that I'm published yet in rats to demonstrate this. And work with it from Sarkis Masmanian and Paul Patterson out of Caltech has demonstrated a significant link between um, a, a model, a mouse model of autism, and the addition of a probiotic in order to alleviate that. Now, what is a mouse model of autism? You've got to ask yourself that question deeply. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the mice do show some very interesting neurological behaviors and physiological disturbances, which are very similar to what we see in autistic children. And the probiotic does tend to alleviate those conditions. So they're moving forward with the phase two trial now, looking at its introduction into a human population. So I, I have hope that we can rebalance people's systems. But I just want to point out, um, I'm slightly biased because my son is perfect just the way he is. And I actually embrace neurological diversity in our community in a way that I think a lot of people are scared to do uh, because the, the other is a little bit too different and they don't like it. Um, maybe academics, this is the right audience to talk about that, right? But, um, uh, so I, I'm actually not trying to cure my son and I wouldn't try and change him for the world. But uh, I know there are other people who are desperately in need of uh, an improvement in their quality of life. Go ahead. No, yes? Uh, all right. In any of them, um, the uh, what is the where is the science at in modifying microbiomes? Um, let me move it out of humans for a second and into soils because I think that's an interesting one. Uh, I, I do have a conflict of interest in this, and in the fact I have a, a, an interest in um, Grossentia, Matt Wallenstein's company, which produces a probiotic to increase your bud growth for those cannabis growers out there. If you want big buds uh, to make you higher, then uh, go with bonds. <laughs> Uh, but, um, in, in that instance, we've demonstrated that in order to actually um, allow those bacteria that we introduce into the soil of these plants to have a significant ability to colonize, we have to disrupt the ecosystem and reduce the stable uh, associations between the existing microbes. The best way to do that from our perspective is to add more carbon, different carbon substrates, into the soil system prior, and it shakes up the status quo, and then you add your probiotic and bing, bam, boom, some of them start to take over. Matt doesn't want to know that, because then they're in the soil and he doesn't have to add more of his product, uh, which would make him poorer, so that's not cool. But theoretically, the same is true for human intestines or buildings or whatever environment you're interested in. Um, we disrupt the in initial ecosystem and then add and overlayer it with a new one. Fecal microbiome transplant works exactly like that, ostensibly, with a little bit of hand waving. Yes? But just a follow-up on that. So I think that's... It's interesting that you say that, and I think that contradicts... What, the cannabis growth? Oh, that too. Oh. But uh, I think that contradicts what one of the things you were doing with the Hindcast, right? So I think I agree with you that when you have a community, it's sort of sometimes hard to push that equilibrium to a new state. Yeah. But yet when you run that Hindcasting, you're saying that these climate variables are just going to change the community to respond to that new climate instantly without the memory of the system. Well, no, so it takes 30 years for it to change, right? Um, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm saying with the hind casting that it takes, you know, if the climate is this, it's going to take 30 years for that equilibrium to reshift, probably due to a change in plant biodiversity in the above ground system. What I guess, I guess, what I'm going at with that that trending is an inability to understand the variance in the parameters of the system. Like the human gut is never going to change to an environment where it looks like open ocean, right? Um, you know, it can't. It has to stay within certain bounds. Don't and many soil systems are the same. So if I'm looking at a prairie, it has bounds of influence. It's, it's very hard to go outside of those bounds. 
We don't necessarily know what those bounds are, but if we sample through the parameter variance space, we may be able to capture those bounds. And if we can link the parameter variance space to what the climate does to the microbiome, or even indirectly or directly, we can have at least an ability to predict the variance in, that, in, in the microbiome space, the structural space. So the structural space of that microbiome, that system, within the bounds of reality. But you're right in the fact that I can't pine cast back 150 years or even, even 100 years as in the Nepal system one and actually be accurate. But I'm only utilizing that to demonstrate the opportunity to identify how similar trends exist irrespective of my ability to predict it. Um, if you will, just try to identify an underlying current of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, of information which predicts a, an emergent property which I don't necessarily yet understand. Um, and we can do that with reasonable accuracy, I think, even if it's within the bounds of uh, predictability. All right, I want to thank our speaker, oh. Jack Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs>